So today, um, in this salon, um, which is, like I said, the third one, we'll be exploring the literature of Elizabeth Gaskell and Samuel Bamford. And I am delighted to have my guest here today, who are going to um, speak to us. Um, so Diane Doffy and Robert Gould, um, they will introdu introduce themselves shortly. And hopefully we're going to delve into the lives of both of those wonderful people. So I'm going to hand it over to you now to take us away, as they say. And just I want to say thank you, everyone, for coming today as well. We, we, love, we love having you here in Manchester History Club. So I hope you enjoy the session. OK, I'll thank you, Karen. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a trustee and a volunteer, and I do a great deal of research for the Elizabeth Gaskell House in Manchester. And I have I think there are a couple of our fellow volunteers in the audience today. So lovely to see you uh, here. Um, so I'm going to talk about Elizabeth Gaskell's life and a little bit about her writing. And then I'm thinking that perhaps Robert and I can talk about connections with Samuel Bamford um, in the discussion afterwards. So this will be just generally about Elizabeth Gaskell. Can we screen share? Do you want me to do it? Or okay. can do that? So I've got a PowerPoint here. Um, oh, that's right. OK, so um, Elizabeth Gaskell uh, on the left here, and she didn't marry someone who was an awful lot older than her. Just we haven't got a more uh, a younger image of, of William. So um, there was only five years between them. This is Elizabeth uh, in eight, 1822. Uh, no, sorry, 1832, when she was 22. And uh, I think William's probably about 50 on that one. So and there's, there's nothing else. So uh, unfortunately for William. Um, she married William in 1832 in Knotsford, where she lived with her aunt. Oh, it's gone on there. She lived with her aunt here at uh, Heathside, Heathwaite, the Heath, uh, any of those names will do. It's uh, called all of them. And I've put this up because I want to show you that this was a, a definitely a middle class household. She was brought up very middle class. And um, there's certainly no doubt about that. Um, so when she married William, um, she moved to Manchester uh, in 1832 and she moved to Dover Street. Now, Dover Street, I'm just trying to get this. Is it going to work? Right. OK, so Dover Street is up here. This is where she lived. And then she moved to Upper Rumford Street um, here, if you can see that. And uh, in 1850, she moved to Plymouth Grove. Now, I can't reach over the other side, um, but as you can see, that triangular um, part there, oh, <laughs> part there on the map, um, where our, our, I'm saying our house, because this is where we've, uh, we've taken over the house that she moved into, is just off the map um, on the top edge of the triangle there. So she didn't move very far, but each move, took her further into the countryside, if we can say that about Manchester at all. Right, next one. So this is where she moved to. And uh, again, I'll have to point on the screen. Uh, this is, oh, I'll put a pointer on actually, so you can see that. This is where our house is on Plymouth Grove. And you can see it's rather magnificent. And she had an extreme conscience about living in a place like that when the Manchester had so many poor people who were starving and suffering uh, terrible conditions. Of course, Samuel Bamford wrote poems about that and was quite interested in that situation too. But you can see that it looked quite rural. They were all very large, wealthy merchants, uh, manufacturers, houses. But I'll tell you now that by 1889, all the north end of that street, the top end, um, was filled in with terraced housing. So it didn't stay rural for very long. Um, in 1848, after losing uh, three children, um, the last one, Willie, died at nine months in 1845, um, Elizabeth was distraught and William suggested that she write. And she did. She wrote Mary Barton. It was published in 1848. Unfortunately, 
it was the year of revolution and the second wave chartists uh, movement mm -hmm. And it went down like a lead balloon with some of her contemporaries. It was published anonymously initially. Um, it was published, um, she didn't put her name on novels until 1857. Um, it started off, she wanted to call it John Barton. Then she decided that she would, uh, the publisher suggested Mary Barton. So she suggested Mary Barton, a love story, and they published it as a tale of Manchester life. So you can see the political elements there creeping into the publication process. And of course, the publishers saw an opportunity to uh, stir, stir things up with a book that was supporting the working classes, very much supporting the working classes. And Elizabeth's contemporaries felt that she would betrayed her peers you know, betrayed the manufacturer, manufacturers, not all of them, but quite a number of them. Um, William Gregg was, was one of them. Um, I'm putting this out, no, you can't make out the absolute detail on this map. That's not what it's there for. It's just to show you the absolute vastness of Manchester. This is 1848. You may well be surprised at the size of it so early on. And the two arrows there show the positions that Elizabeth walked from to. She walked from uh, Dover Street at the, the bottom arrow up to Broughton, which is in Salford. It took her two and a half hours, two and a half hours there and two and a half hours back. So you can see the vastness. And you can imagine walking through the streets, which were not pleasant, uh, particularly. Uh, evidently, over half of them were impassable because of rubbish and read for rubbish, whatever your imagination decides to put in there. So this is a close up. And uh, again, I don't think it's going to, no, it's not working on there, is it? Um, I'm going to start with the beginning of Mary Barton. So I'll have to get up and point on the screen here, but um, as you can see Plymouth Grove here, and I might be able to reach with, with this. Um, this is our house here, and this is Greenhays here, Pepper Hill Farm. So again, it's not too far away, and if you can see, it wasn't too um, built up uh, then. If you go to Greenhays now, it probably looks like a NATO disaster area. Uh, quite a lot of demolition, and what hasn't been demolished is, has been rebuilt as, uh, as high-rise. So a lot of offices, um, apartments, etc. Then it was quite des res, and who was living there? Charles Halley was living there. Um, Samuel Duckinfield Derbyshire, who knew every influential man in Manchester, useful contact. And um, Sidney Potter, Beatrix Potter's uncle. We're all living in Greenhays, um, which is why Elizabeth visited the area quite often. And the part that I pointed to was Pepper Hill Farm, which she uses at the start of Mary Barton's. Now, I've just put a small bit, a small degree of, of text in there. Um, I'm, I'm noticing that she talks about a farmyard a belonging to one of the old world gable black and white houses. Uh, there's the gabled black and white house at the bottom. Um, she talks about a field and she talks about a pond. And you can see that they're all there Coming down from Green Hayes, a path that goes on the map that goes past um, the farm, round the pond, yeah? And you can even see, if you look closely, something growing up the door of the, of the farmhouse. That's how close her descriptions were. So close that Susanna Winkworth and her sisters recognised Elizabeth Gaskell as the writer of Mary Barton because they'd just been there with Elizabeth and she talked to them about it. Bit of a giveaway, I suppose, really, that, isn't it? Um, so this is the beginning of Mary Barton where the, um, the workers go to Green Hayes and just to go back to the images there, can see the one on the right is the, the style that she actually talks about, a style in Green Hayes, and this is in Manchester Art Gallery, the actual... Um, painting. So useful that, I think, interesting. So what have we got here? We've got London Road Station. So Mary Barton has got to have been set starting off way before 1842. 
because Alice Wilson lives in Barber Street, which is literally underneath London Road Station. So she couldn't have lived in a cellar in Barber Street in 1842 because London Road Station would have been sat right on top of her. Um, so it, it's got to have been set before then and after 1830 because Mary Barton catches the train from Manchester to Liverpool, which opened in 1830. So you can see this sort of time period. It does move on in time, does move on. So it may have started somewhere like 1838 and ended up somewhere like 1841 because Alice has Alice moves from her cellar and goes to live with her sister-in-law. So that's London Road. And the main road ab above it, and I've got another map here, this one, is Great Ancourt Street. Great Ancourt Street runs down to Ardwick at one end and up towards Manchester Cathedral, Shoedale and, you know, Victoria Station at the other end. And I think that's probably the main focal point of a lot of um, Mary Barton. You've got Angel Meadow up here, you know, the hell on earth and the scuttlers. Uh, yeah, not a very nice place to live. Um, and um, we, I think this is probably pretty much the focal point of the novel. The Bartons lived in Ancourts, which is, uh, sorry, the Wilsons lived in Ancourts, which is up here. Uh, Jem worked in Ancourts. Aunt Esther lived in Angel Meadow, and I think the Bartons live somewhere around here on the, on the what I'm saying, the left of uh, London Road Station. And Mary worked in Ardwick at, as a dressmaker's apprentice. So lots and lots of the novel are focused around there. And look at all these terraced houses, packed so closely together. And um, you can see that when they were walking, and this is really, this is just a, a more close up of the area. So when the people were walking from Green Hayes, Barton and Wilson and their family, uh, at the beginning of, of the book, they go past these terrace courts. Now I've got the, uh, photographs of, of Ancoats. And uh, just to look at the bottom here, they're talking about back-to-back -back housing with a gutter running between where slops were poured into. Now slops, well, who knows what that meant, uh, into. And they strung their washing across from one side to the other. Remembering, if, if, you, if you knew already and understanding if you didn't, that the smoke of Manchester could be seen from the Lake District, I wonder how clean their washing was when they took it in. Just make me wonder, I'm afraid that. Uh, but you can see how accurate those descriptions actually are. But the other thing that I was really interested in, in that it's the, about the third paragraph of the second chapter, she talks about as they move from the country to the town, the darkness closed in because of these claustrophobic back to back, row on row of terraced houses. Just got some more pictures here. This is Anne Coates. Look at the smoke. That's the daytime. And here, uh, again, I'm just showing this um, double map. I couldn't get them to map, match up very well because they're two different maps, these, but um, Great Anne Coates Street uh, here. And I'm thinking that when Carson's Mill sets on fire in Mary Barton, that it's this one here, Manchester Mills. And I'm thinking that because there was a fire there in 1838, it's on Grace's Guides. And also I'm thinking that because it must have been quite close to where Mary and the Wilsons lived, reasonably close within walking distance. And everybody was, you know, like they did in those days. It was a great excitement, um, even though it happened quite often. Mill fire, everybody rushes out to have a look. You know, of course they do. Um, and so this is my idea that the Great Ancourt Street into Swan Street, into Miller Street, these streets are still there. Great Ancourt Street's part of the Northern, Northern Ring Road now. Uh, and, and I think one of the mills is still there on the Northern Ring Road. As I was driving past, I noticed it uh, a few months ago. This is Angel Meadow. Okay, it's 18, it, it's later, it's, it's 1908 and it's the, the 1880s, but, just look at those buildings in the top, on the top picture. Just look at them. Aunt Esther was living there. It was a home to vagrants, addicts, alcoholics, thieves, you know, general, I suppose, ne'er-do-wells, if you like. 
and it was a very unpleasant place to live. And the guy at the bottom here was the leader of the scuttlers. Well, one of them anyway. And again, this is a close up of London Road Station and you can see the, uh, the area there. Um, just a few statistics for you. I don't need to talk about them, really, do I? Uh, but you can see 18,000 people living in cellars, over 5,000 cellars in Manchester, over 4,000 of them inhabited. And then this was 1843. I think the overall population in Manchester then was about quarter of a million. And this is an etching, because you don't get photographs as early as 1838, the, obviously. This is an etching of a cellar. And if you read Mary Barton, and Robert and I were talking about this the other week, the first 18 chapters are really a documentary of Manchester. And uh, she talks about these cellars uh, with sewage, you know, sewage running down the wall, or slops from the road, and uh, oil cloth uh, padding out the windows to keep the draft out. And you can see the rags there in the window in that uh, in that image. Um, just to, as I said, it's a bit of a whistle top to, stop tour um, and I'm nearly finished now. Um, this is the Fairburns mill. It's an iron foundry. And it's again, off Great Ancourt Street. Uh, if you can see Great Ancourt Street there, and I, I've marked the foundry on with red arrows. And um, this is where Jem Wilson worked, we think, I think. And the reason why I think that is because he was an engineer and he had his invention patented by his boss. And uh, William Fairburn, who was a friend of the Gaskells and another Unitarian, uh, patented his, uh, one of his workers, his, one of his apprentices' uh, inventions for him. He was called Robert Smith, the uh, man involved. And it's such a close situation and I know she says that she doesn't use real people but all writers write from their experiences and she must have thought that was a really interesting idea that these these workers these apprentices could actually be clever enough to do something like that and be taken on board by their employer and, and I think that's something that she wanted to say uh, the workers were not just a faceless mass and you can see that in Job Lee as well um, and this is, uh, I was just talking about Manchester Mills at the top there, and this is a photograph of Arkwright's Mill. And if you look at the number of floors and the description in Mary Barton, this is Manchester Mills, it was originally Arkwright's Mill, you can see that it could possibly, quite possibly, have been the model for the Carson's Mill in Mary Barton. And this is Redhill Mill in Ancourt. And it's not in Mary Barton, but I've just put this image in to show you the vastness of these places. It was absolutely enormous. As you can see that, can't you? You can see that. And uh, th this was on um, Red Hill Street in, in Manchester. And these red stars are all the mills just off Oxford Road. Mm. And I put this on because... George Wilson is going out to look for work along Oxford Road at the mills, and this is where he collapses and dies in, in Mary Barton. So this is just to show you the vastness, again, the amount of these things belching out smoke from their huge chimneys. And on the bottom right is um, Minchel Mills. And that was run by Wainwright and James Bellhouse. And Wainwright Bellhouse lived next door to what but one to Mrs Gaskell. So, you know, there we are, nepotism or something. <laughs> um, and that's just the Mechanics Institute, which again was founded mainly by the Unitarians. Um, it, there was a school for girls there from 1845, teaching middle class girls, uh, you know, basics. And uh, William used to teach there two nights a week. And that just, I think, shows their dedication to improving the life of the working classes and to education for all in general so that's me um over to you robert hmm, thank you interesting um i'll begin um i think with the reference to samuel bamford in mary barton if you get the slides up yeah um because samuel bamford actually appears by name in mary barton um, 
after the trade unionist John Barton comes back and reports the crushing failure of the Chartist March on London to petition Parliament, there's an old weaver naturalist called Job Lee, a kind of character that Bamford from Middleton would have known very well. And Lee relates the story of his own daughter's lonely death in the capital. And then to try and restore everybody's spirits, he offers to read what he calls a bit of a poem as is written by a weaver like ourselves, a rare chap, I'll be bound, who could weave verse like this. And so, says Gaskell, he read out a little poem of um, Samuel Bamford's, God help the poor who on this wintry morn come forth from alleys dim and courts obscure. It's to the tune of Christians Awake, another Manchester song. Amen, said Barton. And a footnote in the novel, the novel has footnotes, explains that Bamford is the fine spirited author of passages in the life of a radical, a man who illustrates his order and shows what nobility may be in a cottage. And there is Bamford's cottage in uh, near, near Booth Hall Children's Hospital uh, and uh, the entrance place to uh, Boggart Hole Club, uh, no longer there. Um, these verses of Bamford play an important part in subsequent events because John Barton asks his daughter Mary to copy out the lines of Bamford's poem for him. And the paper on which she uses, she does this copy, is later used as wadding in the gun that kills her Carson, the factory owner's son, which is quite a demonstration of the power of poetry. Um, but Bamford was not just a fine old working man who wrote touching poems. Um, he was, a, at the time he met at the Gaskells, probably around about 1838, he was 50 years old. He was most famous. I have this in common with Bamford, that both of us, despite our efforts in many different directions, are best known for Peterloo and probably always will be. Um, and uh, Bamford had been born, you can't quite see it there, but he, he was born in Middleton in 1788, the year before the French Revolution. Um, he, he was trained as a handling weaver. He married met Jemima and married her in 1810, joined the post-war radical movement in, in Middleton as the secretary of the local radical club. And in 1819, published a lot of poetry, uh, was one of the leading organisers of Peterloo, which he later wrote about in the Chartist period in his biography, Passages in the Life of a Radical. And it was round about this time that he got to know William and Elizabeth Gaskell. And he did so as an established writer and poet, but not quite yet as the author of a Passage in the Life of a Radical. William Gaskell gave a popular series of lectures to working men in 1838, which he called Poetry and Poets in Humble Life. Elizabeth wrote to her friend Mary Howitt, we're picking up all the poets in humble life we can think of. Um, Mary Howitt was a fan of Bamford. And Bamford, now 50 years old, was something of a father figure. And in fact, his poem was included along, several of his poems, including a couple of William Gaskells alongside them, were, were included in a volume of Manchester Poetry edited by the journalist James Wheeler that came out in 1838. Bamford by then was going, oh, there, there is Bamford's poem, Song of the Slaughter, about Peterloo, which was sold as a penny broadside to benefit him because he was jailed after Peterloo for his part in organising it. And there is the front page of his small booklet of miscellaneous poetry that came out just after he was imprisoned in Lincoln, which shows this kind of very patriotic figure of Britannia with a printing press, not a lion, but a printing press uh, to defend her virtue. Um, in Mary Barton, Elizabeth Gaskell pioneered the use of dialect to convey the emotional fluency and the cultural roots of its speakers. It wasn't, dialect was traditionally just to show funny working class characters who couldn't speak proper English, um, but she used it seriously to convey deep feelings and sincere emotion. And the dialect of Mary Barton owed a great deal to Bamford because Sam William Gaskell had been involved in the early 1840s along with Bamford in a project for the Listen Fills Society to compile a dialect glossary. In fact, Bamford did most of the compiling and his manuscript for that a book length manuscript is in the John Ryland Library. Um, Bamford later, the, 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 the Littenfield abandoned its projects, and it wasn't until later that dialect dictionaries got underway. Let me move on. Oh, it's not just me. That's reassuring. I've, I've, broke, I've broken the internet again. Yeah, good. Um, he published his own, he, he published his own book, um, Bamford in this period was a member, only a very occasional member of the Sun Inn Circle of Poets that lived in this old, old inn near, near Cheatham School, what then, then Manchester Grammar School. And he was not a regular, but an occasional dropper in. So there was this school of working class poets that was get the working class poetry and literary scene was getting going 
at this time. He later published his own version of um, the dialect dictionary as the glossary to his book um, Dialect in South Lancashire, which is a series of dialect uh, sketches, versions of the great 18th century dialect writer Tim Bobbin. And this is later Bamford was satirised by uh, the ghost of Tim Bobbin appears to him like Marley's ghost and saying, what are you doing mucking about with my standard work then, you little shrimp? Um, and in 1854, William Gaskell followed Samuel Bamford's dialect of South Lancashire with his own lang two lectures on Lancashire dialect and about half, I reckon about half the words that, that Gaskell listed were actually words that he got from Bamford. So Bamford and William Gaskell were fellow scholars and they fed into Mary Barton in a scholarly literary way. Bamford was not just a pet working class figure who said a few nice comforting things at the right moment. Um, Bamford was an occasional visitor to the Gaskell's house at Upper Rumford Street and to a, a visitor to the future um, writer Geraldine Dewsbury, a close friend of the Gaskells, unmarried and lonely, who lived near Green Hills Field, Hill Field with her brother. And at the Dewsbury's, Bamford met Thomas Carlyle. But he met Thomas Carlyle because Thomas Carlyle's much nicer and more sensible wife and a better writer, Jane Welsh Carlyle, had read passages in the life of a radical <laughs> and put Thomas Carlyle onto it. In fact, she himself had visited Bamford in his cottage in Blakely. Uh, which you saw just a little bit earlier, he described him as a fine, sturdy old fellow, Bamford. And uh, Thomas later wrote to him appreciatively with advice on literary style. Thomas was famously a windbag and his advice on literary style was to be brief, which he expanded at great length as well. And he sent Bamford an inscribed copy of his book on Chartism, past and present. And this was 1847, just before Chartism <laughs> appears in Mary Barton. Bamford also had a little literary episode that involved Elizabeth Gaskell and Alfred Lord Tennyson. Because in 1848, Bamford and 49, Bamford was a bit of a low point. Early days, the second volume of his autobiography, which came out at the second Chartist period, hadn't been such a big success as Passages in the Life of a Radical. He'd failed to win the public recognition that he'd hoped as a writer as well. He was still pigeonholed as a, a working class writer and not a sort of Manchester writer, a nationally known literary scholar, a status which he felt he deserved. He read Mary Barton, found himself into it, in it, and wrote this letter to Elizabeth Gaskell. Dear Madam, I finished reading Mary Barton last night. I could not lay the book down until I had read to the end. You have drawn a fearfully true picture, a mournfully beautiful one, which you've also placed on the tables of the drawing rooms of the great and good it must there effect. You're a genius of no ordinary rank. I care not what the critics say. A sorrowfully beautiful production it is, few being able to contemplate it with tearless eyes. I could not, I know. The dialect, I think, might have been given better, but in describing the feelings of the poor, their manners, their kindliness towards each other, their feelings towards their superiors in wealth and station, their faults, their literary tastes, and their scientific pursuits like old Job Lee, you've been very faithful. Of John Barton, I have known hundreds, his very self in all things except his fatal crime. Bamford was thinking back to the traps laid for radicals in the radical period. And my heart fills as I write, he said, and I cannot go on. Well, Mary, the, Mary, uh, Elizabeth Gaskell and Bamford met again, and Elizabeth Gaskell found that Bamford was a great fan of Tennyson. He could, he could recite a lot from Tennyson and became very emotional when he did it. He'd learnt the poems by heart. And so in October 1849, Elizabeth Gaskell wrote to John Forster, the London literary figure who knew everybody and published everybody, to secure a presentation copy for Bamford of Tennyson's poems, explaining Bamford is the most hearty admirer of Tennyson that I know. A signed copy duly arrived, and on the 7th of December 1849, Gaskell walked with two friends the six miles to Bamford's little whitewashed cottage in Blakely to find him. His wife Mima welcomed them in and gave us bread and butter and many kind, gentle words, but suggested they should look for Bamford back in Manchester. At last, she said, we pounced upon the grey stalwart man coming out of a little old-fashioned public house. I kept my book back like a child eating the paste before the preserve, till we got through all the commonplace crust of conversation, and then I produced it, and he said, this is grand. I said, look at the title page. And, and he was standing reading it there in the street. Well, I'm a proud man this day, he said, when he saw the dedication. And he turned it up and down and read a bit. It was a very crowded street. And his grey face went quite brown red with pleasure. We left him in a sort of sleepwalking state and only trust he will not be run over. After a visit to Bamford, she reported one more thing. 
He says when he lies awake at night, as in his old age, he often does, and he gets sadly thinking of the days that are gone when his child was alive, and he soothes himself by repeating Tennyson's poems. And this draws attention to another powerful bond between himself and Gaskell, the loss of a child. She had lost three. Uh, Bamford and, and Mima uh, lost, their lost their only daughter, Anne, who died of consumption in 1835, age only 25. Yeah. And he wrote how her death had withered the only hope which clung around his heart. So this powerful, but this is the death of a child is a powerful bond between, the, which tends to unite the classes in Mary Barton. It, in a way, united Bamford and Gaskell as well. And there is Bamford in writerly mode in his old coat, like a Scotch cattle drover. Interestingly, it has it he holding a quill pen in his hand and he's writing in a photographic studio, probably in 1856. Um, this is a real, the only photograph of, we know apparently of a 19th century working class writer, apparently in the act of writing. And in Bamford's cottage in Blakely, visitors could see the couple's two fine old wooden rocking chairs either side of the fire with the names Sam and Mima carved upon them in old English lettering. You can just see the M on Sam taken years after Mima's death here. And in the empty space between the two chairs on the mantelpiece was displayed Bamford's poem, Lament for My Daughter. She wept that we so soon must part. She knew that death was at her heart. Ye were but three, O God above. Couldst thou not spare that group of love? And Bamford regularly visited Mima's grave, uh, uh, Anne's grave and put and planted fresh flowers around it. And it's nice to see that still in the churchyard there are fresh, flat, fresh flowers planted around the grave. The Gaskell Bamford wrote, Sorrow, it seems, is revealed to yourself and the world, the secret of your powerful mind and the force and truth of your benign feeling, a noble gift you've discovered, a humanised and humanizing blessed thing is sorrow. So there is Bamford again in 1856, a better version of the photo, hand-coloured, superb quality photo. So the Bamford character in Mary Barton is a conventional salt-of-the-earth working man with homely dialect words for, to, to comfort people in their hour of sorrow. But Elizabeth Depp, to Bamford, Elizabeth Gaskell's debt to Samuel Bamford was a debt to a, a scholar and a fellow author. And in placing him by name in Mary Barton, she paid tribute not simply to a poor man, but to a fellow writer. Right. Um, I was actually, uh, Robert, really interested in that letter that Samuel sent to Elizabeth Gaskell because he talks about the Mary Barton being sorrowful and mournful. <laughs> And uh, when she got criticism for it, she said that people had misunderstood her work because she saw it as a tragic poem. Mm. So clearly she was she would have been really pleased, wouldn't she, that he uses those words that suggest tragedy when she saw it as a tragedy herself. Yes, that was exactly what appealed to him about it. And, and to have to put him in the novel and to as the as the working man who has the experience to communicate and then to have him write to her to say yes you hit the nail on the head with this book you know it appealed to me you've got everything right in it mm. was a powerful validation for her and I think she allowed herself to be bullied by Greg yeah, with his snotty absolutely. reviews and I think <laughs> North and South is clearly a much more cautious and less authentic mm. uh, uh, view of, of, of life than Mary Barton is as, as a result of her paying too much attention to critics like Greg. Uh, Paul was asking about where that photograph of Bamford came, the double photograph, the stereo, stereo photograph. It was a small version of a photograph. It must have been taken in the same, same session as the other one at that, probably 1856, in, the, in Jackson's Pioneer and Keep, uh, photo studio in Middleton and it's actually a stereoscope picture there was a fashion in the 1850s for these and you could also buy glasses to look at them in stereo with slightly different colored lenses and and uh, I did get some of these red you know these red and green glasses but they weren't really quite good enough I have attempted to get Bamford in stereo and I one, one good project actually for a graphic artist Paul would be to try and restore that double image of Bamford, which is water damage. It is a pop thing to be carried around and see if we can get a good enough copy for people to look at it in 3D glasses and get Bamford in 3D. That would be yeah. <laughs> You're on, aren't you?
Yeah, I mean, she got the characters right and she got the, the atmosphere of Manchester right in, in mm. Toby Barton. And as you say, I, I quite agree with that. It's mm. a very immediate book. It's a very Manchester book, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Um, and you feel that if you walk the streets, you'd see what she was seeing. You'd mm. hear what she was hearing. You'd understand what she was understanding. And I think her main, you know, a real focal point of it is the fact that she didn't want to paint the working classes as a faceless, ignorant mob. Mm. I think that was really important to her, to show them as human beings and individual and not hands, just the bit of them that was useful. Mm. Yeah, and that was a bit more the tendency of North and South. When she describes trade unions, she has them riots and she yet they act like an insensate mob and she describes them having a sort of bestial collective consciousness that, that, that takes over. And and yet the you know the strike that she was writing about the Preston lockout of eighteen fifty three to four was an incredibly broad based community dignified articulate well organised protest. It was nothing at all like that. And Charlotte Bronte does the same in Shirley. She has this sort of growling brainless mob of working people developing. And I think Mary Barton is before these other industrial novels. And I think there's something special about it because of that. Mm. She always had Bamford's example in front of her mm. when writing about working people. Why did he move to London? Ah, he moved to London, I think partly because of the abuse he got because of about dialect in South Lancashire, because I showed you that satirical picture. Mm. And uh, somebody who was very close to Bamford, Bamford thought he knew who it was, but he didn't, and I do. I think <laughs> I do. I'm not going to tell you, though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, wrote a really vicious satire about Bamford with illustrations in which he pressed all of Bamford's private buttons very, very accurately. And because it was anonymous and because Bamford was already felt very suspicious about people around him, he'd been betrayed and, 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 and ratted on and, and, and informed on in various ways in the past. He moved to London and, and took up a job as a civil servant for seven years and then moved back to uh, to, to not to Middleton again, mm. but to um, to Moston, just south of Boggart Hall Club in the 1858. It's interesting that you talk about the Howitts, <clears throat> because, of course, uh, William Howitt took the manuscript of Mary Barton right, mm. to try and get it published. And mm. John Forster, who I noticed from your essay, was also uh, known to Bamford. And mm. sort of, I don't know whether he was a friend, but maybe a friend in inverted commas. Um, was the one that took Mary Barton in and published it mm. and, and for Chapman and Hall and then sent it to Charles Dickens, who was his, he was his friend. And um, Charles Dickens then invited Elizabeth to write Household Words. So really that was the start of, mm. of her writing career. Um, well, um, yes, Thomas Carlyle sent a note to Dickens suggesting Bamford as a writer for... Dickens's newspaper, he's, it was at the Daily News in the early 1850s. Um, but Dickens had a very brief interview with Bamford and rejected him, mm -hmm. which must have been quite hurtful to Bamford, because mm -hmm. for various reasons, Bamford resented Dickens' success. Dickens was incredibly rude and hostile about Manchester, and Manchester loved him, whereas, whereas Bamford did his best to be positive about Manchester, which he actually hated, and <laughs> Manchester never recognised him properly. So to, to show... To show Marley's ghost, if you like, coming to haunt Bamford was a really underhand, you know, a really accurate piece of, of, of hostile satire. <laughs> yeah. So Bamford did visit Carlisle in the 1850s in London. He dropped into his house in, in Chain Row in, in Chelsea now and again. Uh, he, he had made contact with Dickens, but he never made it as a writer. He'd always intended to do a third volume of mem memoirs, but his, his work in, the, in, in Somerset House for the Inland Revenue was just too tiring at his age in his 60s. So he never... He he never made he, he maybe was hoping to become a metropolitan writer and get the kind of success that Gaskell got, but it never happened to him. Mm. He he moved back to Lancashire at the age of seventy. Or maybe Gaskell's middle class um, sort of upbringing, etc., was set her in a better stead for being published at that. Time. Oh, massively, yes, mm. massively. But it also allowed her to uh, get the influence to help. Mm help people didn't, you know I mean she knew a lot of influential people she got a lot of people on board mm. um Lord Lansdowne was one um the, the, I can't remember what he was called Haverton Lord Haverton mm. you know so a lot of people in in high places actually took some notice of her I think yeah. she was a even though she was a woman yes 
Lord Lansdowne also paid for a copy of Passage in the Life of a Radical and, and, and rather really? liked it, yes. And Bamford did manage to get introductions to people, but they finished there. They would just order a copy of his book, send him a bit over for the extra postage and send him a nice note. And that was it. He, he didn't do networking, Bamford. He wasn't considered a subject for networking. So we had the same sort of you know, literary connections that, that Gascon might have had, but they just began and end with, oh, working man, this is a fine book you've written. Yes, very, very authentic, well done. Here's an extra sort of 10 shillings for you. Was he intimidated by these things? Because when she asked him, when she she says something about him writing a letter to thank John Forster or for the Tennyson book and he doesn't want to write it. I don't think anybody ever intimidated Bamford. Oh, he right, was extremely okay. proud and prickly. <laughs> he might He might grumble fiercely about it afterwards and feel very slighted but intimidated never no, no. No. maybe you just couldn't be bothered then <laughs> more the case yeah okay um my question was um a bit about um uh, elizabeth gaskell about her um, background and and you, you said she was from a, a very wealthy sort of background what was the what's what was what's what was the family um, I'm, I'm, I didn't actually say she was very wealthy. But middle I mean, class, certainly, I think. Certainly Where did she derive William, her wealth from? Yes. <laughs> well, her family, uh, the Holland family, her mother's side, were farmers in Sandlebridge in Cheshire. Right. Okay. Um, her uncle, Peter Holland, was the doctor in Nutsford. Uh, and you can see him uh, appearing in a number of novels as Nutsford does under sort of various guises or a version of Nutsford. Her uncle Samuel Holland had um, a house in Wales. He was uh, he ran the slate quarries of Blaenau Festiniog, and and his son. Guess what? Samuel Holland. Just to confuse everybody that wants to try and do family trees. So they were they were reasonably wealthy. Williams family um, had a sailcloth business in Warrington, um, and. When you say wealthy, um, you know they were they were middle class. They were middle class. I don't think they were, you know, had oodles of money, so to speak. Uh, William got four hundred pound legacy when that sailcloth business was sold, and um, his uncle died, and his aunt uh, left it to William, and and obviously the other, you know, men because it would be men in the will. Um, so he got four hundred pound legacy. She got a four hundred pound legacy from her aunt. Um, when uh, Adelaide and, and Hannah uh, died. So they did have family money. Uh, we do know that they were bringing in £1,100 a year, according to Meter, when they moved to a Plymouth Grove, which was a big house, which in 1852 had five servants. And I think they needed that much to, to run it. And they did send their children, the girls, to school, albeit at sort of staggered intervals. Um, she was always complaining about being hard up. So very wealthy, I would question that. Yeah, that's uh, very weird but bit, comfortably yeah. off, yes, definitely. Okay. And what did William do? Did he, he? You mentioned him teaching at the Mechanics Institute. William was the Unitarian Minister at Cross Street Chapel for 56 years. He went out in a, in a box in 1884 when he died. Um, he also taught at uh, Owens College, which became the University of Manchester. He, and he taught at the Mechanics Institute. He had students. He did, you know, he's a workaholic. He did lots of things. Yeah, thank you. And just just briefly on that, um, the Count Cheshire County Society, with which Gaskell was very involved, was also the predominantly conservative, very conservative county society, which produced eight troops of yeomanry, county yeomanry cavalry. I think Peter Holland might have been uh, the uh, surgeon or doctor to one of the the troops of yeomanry cavalry so we had to tread a careful line and so did Gaskell in county in county society and the Cheshire yeomanry um arrived at Peterloo at the same time as the regular troops and attacked the flags and banners and took their revenge for having been uh, bested at Stockport a few months before um Peter Holland was also the doctor for the apprentices at uh, Style Mill Uh, this is a question for Robert. Um, it's National Poetry Day today, and you quoted a little snippet from Bamford right at the beginning of your section. Mm. Um, I think there's a well, a 
a variety of opinion about the quality of Bamford's poetry. Um, what's your opinion? And do you have a favourite piece of his? My favourite poem of Bamford's. I didn't bring the text with me. I should have at Tim Bobbin's grave. I think it's a tremendous poem. It's one of the best poems of the 19th century. And it's in dialect. And I think the thing about Bamford was, like all poem, like all working class poets, he tried to write imitative nature poetry in standard English. And it comes off like a Christmas card verse. It doesn't really work very well. Um, although I have heard, I think, read by people with the same you know, language, the same dialect as Bamford, I've, I've heard it come over really, really well, actually. Um, but on in print, it doesn't look terribly or original. But Bamford, you know, the, Bamford always wrote about what he saw, what he could see in his mind. He wasn't writing about Christmas card flowers when he wrote about flowers. He he knew the flowers. They might have been the flowers on his daughter's grave. They were. It was always real for Bamford, but the style that he copied it wasn't always. When he wrote verse in dialect, I think it was superb, and um, it's some of the best stuff for me written in. I'm no judge, but I, I like it very much. And uh, yeah, I'd love. We've had Bamford events where you know some of the poems are recited by people from well, from Middleton, you know, and I think it works superbly well. Yeah, he's also very comical in his poetry too, and he also copies other meters quite a lot, which is very common in 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 poets and also people who do protest songs. You you copy a song that's already there, so he copies Christians Awake, and he copies quite a lot of things of Burns as well, and 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 puts them in other context so by using dialect quite he, i mean he, most of bamford's poem is standard english not dialect but by imitating the, the rhythms of others including tennyson what he's saying is that the subject matter that he wrote about working class life nature little villages flowers and so on to ordinary people are just as much subjects for for poetry as the charge of the light brigade and tennyson's finest feelings i think that when when you read his poetry when you read the dialect i think it helps to read it out loud yeah. even if you're not very good at reading dialect and you're not reading it to an audience i think it comes over and you the, the essence of it comes through better it's a bit like shakespeare you don't understand every little bit of, but if you watch the whole thing you might miss a lot of the detail but you'll you'll get the the whole story through the the whole play um yeah. but reading it individually is a bit laborious sometimes dialect is is read to be written out loud you know it's like bob dylan's lyrics and they, they need to be sung um uh and in fact the trouble with dialect is it's not written in dialect it's written in with in standard english with all sorts of tortured spellings and stops and punctuation marks and so on which makes it almost impossible to read you've got to be a very sophisticated reader of standard english in order to be able to read dialects and then translate it mentally back dialect was written to be read out loud and heard directly and mostly it was it was a different form of literary communication and these days with performance poetry and rap you know we're very familiar with that again Thanks. yeah I'd, I'd like to ask about um, the politics of Gaskell and Bamford and the extent to which they actually shared a similar view yeah. in that uh, obviously um, Bamford was a radical certainly his younger years and uh, Gaskell's had a Unitarian background from a, a, a upper middle class sort of outlook. Did they actually share? Is there evidence they actually shared the same political view when they they were collaborating? That that is a good question. Um, Bamford had become much more conservative by late in the eighteen twenties, early eighteen thirties. The experience of Peterloo and and what happened, you know, when some when some you know, people get hurt when you get these things seriously wrong, uh, had made him, I think, very very timid and changed him as you as you would expect. Um, and by the late eighteen thirties, he was seeing himself. He wrote passages in the life of a radical because he saw himself as somebody whose bitter experience of being a patriot radical campaigner and suffering for it had important lessons both for the positive ways that you should campaign which is not pretend to be a working class and sound like a working class and act like a mob but to act like british citizens and patriots and expect to be treated like that that hadn't worked to peterloo so we also warned people about the dangers of of, of plotting the dangers of being infiltrated by spies the dangers of taking things too fast by the 1830s his view was that uh the working classes would eventually be ready for the vote but he thought that education had to happen first and that basically puts him in a very similar camp 
to middle class reformers who thought that, yes, when we educate the working class, they'll be fit to vote. So there is a lot of overlap. But for that very same reason, Bamford very much resented people who had similar political views from, of his, but who came from a different direction and didn't have his experience, who were just patronising about it. Well, of course, as a woman, Elizabeth Gaskell couldn't be political, could she? You know, she couldn't have a political opinion, but there were Whigs. Um, uh, but she writes in a letter, I think I'm becoming conservative. I'm reading the Times, you know, uh, but R William's congregation were very radical. I mean, you've got people there like the Potters, Thomas Potter, who with uh, Shuttleworth, John Shuttleworth, um, took that petition in 1831, you know, for uh, um, petitioning for a... Uh, an MP for industrial cities. Mm -hmm. um, Cobden was part of their congregation. You know, so it was a radical congregation. So I would think the politics were uh, up to a point pretty similar um, to Bamford's. It was up to Unitarian. Sorry. The, the congregation is that the, the Yeah, the Unitarian congregation. Your Cross Street Chapel I'm talking about in particular. Um, but there was Brooks, uh, Upper Brook Street Chapel as well. Uh, that was Unitarian and quite a few uh, of their friends who were buried there. In fact, McConnell, you know, McConnell and Kennedy from that massive mill I showed you, um, McConnell's was buried at Brook Street. And they, they uh, dug up all the bodies you know, and shipped them down to Leicestershire when they were doing the, the chapel for student accommodation. And the family complained and they had to bring him back and rebury him, which I thought was very funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just briefly, the mention of Unitarians is important because Unitarians had a profound commitment to the spiritual equality of all human beings, male and female. I think Bamford had psychologically the same kind of commitment but both of them also qualified it. Well, in practice, conditions are not yet right. This is what people are really like, but society is wrong. And when we fix society a little bit, then people will be able to take up their, their true and place. Education, so yes, and ed educa ed spiritual equality plus education plus civilization. So actually they're coming from very similar places, yeah. but I don't think Bamford would have admitted his politics were the same. He would say he was, he was really a radical. He was just a sensible radical. Um. Uh, do you perhaps know why Elizabeth Gaskell, after 1857, used her name on her literature? Is it, was it because she was exposed or was it because it was well, well received? Well, she was the wife of a Unitarian minister. Um, she was writing quite um, controversial material, wasn't she? Um, women didn't put themselves out into the public sphere like that. That wasn't what they did. And so, if you, I mean, if you look at people like the Brontes, George Eliot, they, they all wrote under pseudonyms. And Elizabeth was going to write under a pseudonym, but it had gone to press before she'd made up her mind what she was going to write under. And so it was, was published anonymously. Um, I mean, George Eliot stayed George Eliot, even though people knew who she was. You know, so women didn't tend to write under their names uh, because... Well, just to give you an example, Anne Marsh Caldwell, you've probably never heard of her, but that doesn't matter. Her husband said he didn't want uh, the, the wife of four daughters to be seen publicly as a failed novelist. <laughs> I, and, and on that, I rest my case. <laughs> Hello. Um... As a person who was um, brought up in, was born and brought up in Middleton, and I've lived part of my life there, but not all of my life there. I don't live there anymore. Um, most of the people I grew up with and the people I knew had never heard of Sam Bamford. And the only reason that I, and this is where an anecdote comes in, the only reason I know about him is that my mother religiously, every so often, every couple of years, used to take me up to St. Leonard's Church do you know St. Leonard's Church, where, where Sam Bamford is actually buried in the mm -hmm. cemetery there. And it's a very grand, it's a very grand burial. And I often thought this is, this is um, Middleton's most famous son. And um, I sort of, and I remember the word reformer. Mm -hmm. and, but none of the people that, that I knew from Middleton and, and knew anything about Sam B Bamford. And that is interesting to me. And I'm coming here a long time after that. And... What have you visited the? It is a very grand gravestone in in the cemetery on in Jubilee, at the top of Jubilee Park, and yet nobody knows about Sam Bamford in Middleton. 
he's, he's, uh, they know more about Steve Coogan and Paul Scholes than they do about Sam Bamford. And I think that's very sad that that is the case. So what is your comment about that? Paul who? <laughs> you're crying, you're crying, so you should be. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I, th I think, do you feel that Bamford is now, since Peter Lou, Bamford has become better known in Middleton? Yeah. Yeah, possibly, yeah, mm. possibly. Um, I'm just making a comment, really, that mm. um, maybe you can't be a prophet in, in your own land. Somebody famous once said that, I, don't, I can't remember. Mm. But, <laughs> uh, and maybe, you know, Middleton... He's not, not really interested in Sam Bamford. Interesting. Bamford did very, himself rather fall out with Middleton. Mm. Yeah, he's. I think he's a lot better known than he was. There is a Samuel Bamford trail in Middleton and has been for some time. And the regeneration of Middleton, you know, began about 20 years ago um, with the Edgar Wood Trail, which is the, you know, the, the, uh, the high quality upper middle class architectural buildings. But that golden mm. triangle area also includes a lot of things. I think, I think to, that's come much after the time I'm talking yeah. about. It's, it's um, maybe the working class thing has something to do with it, but um, you know, I went to school in, in Middleton and mm. I went back there and lived there for some time. And maybe because he was political, maybe because he was working class, that he, he was, I don't ever remember anybody that I knew mentioning this person. Mm. And yet I, I was lucky enough to have a mother who dragged me, well, dragged <laughs> me up. It's quite steep up to St. Leonard's uh, Church. And mm. every so often she did and said, there's the grave of Sam Bamford. He's a very important man, you know. Don't never forget that. And even when she moved away to Middleton from Middleton, I was still there. When mm. she came back, she said, "Let's go and see Sam Bamford's grave." Mm. And so, uh, well, if you search for our Sam Middleton man on on the web on YouTube, you can find the film that was made about 2018, 2019 by a, a wonderful youth project, an hour long film about Bamford. Um, so he, he reached part of the the youth, and that that was done. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, a few years ago. I, th I think he's better known now, and I'm still working on his biography. He's very well documented, so it's taking a long time. Well, yes, that's that's done more than anything, but I hope the biography will add a bit more. That's the end, I'm afraid. <coughs> We've come now to two o'clock. Um, so um, thank you very much to Diane and Robert.